I I attempt to move around a lot. Okay, so I will just go like, oh, okay. Okay. I need the slides. You want the slide? Yeah. Okay. Last slide. Slide, okay. I'm done. I'm going to build the tower. Okay. Oh, this, uh, this wouldn't happen without Lucius, though. Uh, I think we should, uh, you know, thank you later for how nice he, he got me here and everything. This is really exciting. Um, yeah, it's great to be here. My name is Bruce Bobgin. I'm one of the Postgres core team members. I've been working with Postgres for 22 years now. And um, happy to work for Enterprise DB, but uh, I spent a lot of time working on the community, working on the code working on promoting Postgres and so forth. Um, my website actually is right here. There's this slide presentation is on my website. So there's a recording of it if you want to see it. There's 20 other presentations about Postgres. I know Alicia set up a voting system to pick what we're going to talk about. So this is a great one. I love I love doing this uh, this presentation. Um, so I think it's going to be uh, I think it's going to be a really good time. Um, just to give you a little background of how I got here, um, I was I was scheduled to do a couple of events in Germany toward the end of this week, actually tomorrow. And uh, Alicia asked if I was in the, in the neighborhood, I could come and visit. I said, great. Um, I didn't realize that the uh, Frankfurt Airport was going to go on strike uh, tomorrow. So unfortunately, instead of going out to have beers with everybody, I have to go to the airport after this. So. Sorry, next time I come, we'll do some fun stuff. Uh, I was in, I was in my, um, I was in Warsaw last time for the conference. I did a lot of sightseeing, so I got, got, got that out of the way in October. Uh, but I do apologize. I, I probably am not going to be able to stay here at seven o'clock. Disappointing, but um, I guess it's what's necessary. So I, I do apologize for that. Uh, I did land in in. Um, in the Warsaw Chopin Airport, and I'm in the taxi. I felt like I was in Miami uh, <laughs> because I came from two degrees Celsius weather in Philadelphia with snow, and I'm here, and it's like everyone's out walking around, and you know, it's just the flowers are out, and it's it's wonderful. I, I, I think you should rename it to Florida or something. <laughs> <laughs> was, was, beach. Yeah, the beach. We need a beach. That's all we need. Um, so anyway, yeah, so it was really, uh, it's really great to be here. And again, I apologize, I can't stay as long as I want. Um, so I want to talk about the Postgres Query Optimizer. We can take questions as we go. So um, we'll kind of walk through it. This is about a 45 minute, 50 minute presentation. And, um, the reason it's interesting to me is that um, a lot of people who use databases uh, don't often understand any of the benefits you get when you use a database versus a flat file, for example. Um, of course, there's asset compliance and a whole bunch of other query tools that you get with a relational database. But the optimizer is one of the really important parts because um, it allows you to, it kind of takes some of the problems that you normally have to deal with in your application and gives it to the optimizer. And the optimizer is sort of this brain that's always working, always figuring out how to uh, execute your queries as fast as possible. It's making adjustments based on the type of data you have. If your data changes, the optimizer changes. Um, as you write indexes, it changes. Um, as you change the type of data you have in your system, 
the optimizer automatically is making those adjustments. So this happens behind the scenes, but I think it's interesting to actually watch it happen. And I do have a bunch of slides that actually show you step by step how it happens. Right? Uh, any questions before we get started? Again, yeah, the slides are right here. Right, right, right. All right. So, um, what is, how does, a, how does a system actually work? Well, as you know, the database server is this sort of standalone process. It's always running, accepting connections, typically on port 5432, but again, it could be another port. And we typically have an application. Somebody's written, some developers written, and underneath some kind of interface, interface layer on key to the database. So we're going to say over here, this big amorphous uh, database is making the decisions and it's sending the results back. All right. Um, but inside this sort of square, there's a whole bunch of pieces. Okay. Many of you might have seen this slide before or have seen this slide for other databases because other databases have optimizers too. So if you don't use Postgres, there are other databases, they all have a similar optimizer. So normally a typical relational database has a parser, then some type of optimizer down here, and then an executor. Now there are some other special parts of Postgres here, but for the, for the sake of this discussion, we're going to look at the parser, the optimizer, and the executor. Now, the uh, parser is the part of the database that checks the syntax, makes sure you have a misspelled, a table name, it looks up the column names, it, it identifies a select and an update and a delete and so forth. So that's what the, that's what the parser does. It's a very mechanical process. Okay? Then the optimizer kind of does its magic, and I'll talk about that in a minute, and then it goes to the executor. And the executor Again, is a very mechanical process. It gets a recipe or a plan from the optimizer and it just executes it. We're going to be talking about this idea of a plan all the time, but effectively the, the way the flow works is the parser parses your query, it sends the results to the optimizer. The optimizer uses its smarts to figure out what is the fastest way I can execute this query. And it generates something called a plan and the plan gets sent to the executor, and the plan is really just a recipe or a, a state machine that it tells you to go through, okay, go do this type of join, do this index lookup, do this qualification, and it basically like just a state machine just, just chugs through whatever plan it gets from the executor. But the exciting part to me and the exciting part of Postgres has always been the optimizer, because the other two parts are very mechanical, um, but even when, before Postgres, when I used to work on relational systems like Informix, I was always interested to see, well, how does the system know what, how, what kind of data I have in my system? How does it know what type of join to do? Like, it's sort of a black art, right? And I wrote this presentation to basically visualize that and give you specific um, examples of queries that you can actually see straight on, uh, visually. Okay? And again, this is the big blow up. Parser, then there's a rewrite of traffic cop, which we won't talk about. Then the optimizer down here, and then finally execute it. Okay, so again, optimizer is the brain. Optimizer is the brain. So, what decisions does the optimizer use to have to make? What, what, uh, what is this brain having to decide? There's really three major things, and again, these are not going to make a whole lot of sense to you right now, but they will once we get started. So the first thing the brain of the optimizer has to figure out is something called a scan method. We'll talk about that. Then it has to figure out a join method. There's actually four or five different types of join methods. And then also a join order. So these are the three we kind of are going to be focusing on in terms of what decisions is that optimizer making. So, uh, scans, the first one, right? Uh, what types of scan can we do? There's something called a sequential scan, a bitmap scan, an index scan. Okay. Um, however, before we get started, let's, what we're going to do is we're going to actually pull some data from the system table PG class. Okay? PG class, system table, every Postgres database has one. 
And these are all actually system tables that are defined in the system. So what I'm going to do to set this up is I'm going to take that uh, relation name from each quiz. I'm just going to cut off the first letter. So I'm just going to take the first letter of the relation name. Okay? And I'm going to create a temporary table. So I'm going to basically take the first letter of the relation name, which is a, a single letter. Then I'm going to put a whole bunch of X's in it. And I'm going to randomly insert them into the temp table called sample. Okay? And I'm going to put an index on that table. Now, you, you're looking at this query, you might think, well, well how, do, how do I know this is actually accurate? If you download this SQL file, you can actually run this presentation visually. So the way I wrote this presentation was to write the SQL, run the SQL, capture it, put it in slides. Okay? So every query you're going to see here is actually in this SQL file, optimized for that SQL. Okay, so if you want to kind of research it later, feel free to do that. Um, the other thing we're going to do is we're going to create a little function called lookup letter. We'll use this later, but it effectively is a little PLPG SQL function I'm going to use that generate explain plans. I'll talk about that in a bit. So, what is the distribution? Remember, I told you we created a temporary table called sample. All right, what kind of data do we have in here? So, we're going to run this query and we're going to do some analysis of that data in that sample table. Okay? And this is what we get it's a very asymmetric distribution. 78% of the rows are actually P's. Okay? So out of the 253 rows, 199 are P, because Postgres, and I guess a lot of things start with P, I don't know, whatever. Because a lot of things are PG underscore, that's why, basically. 3% okay? are S's, 3.2% is C's, all the way down to A's, and the least uh, common values are an I and a K. There's only <coughs> one of those, one I and one K in the system. Okay? So that's our sample table. We're going to use the sample table as we go through the exercises to show you how the query is executed. You can actually see me using the sample table over and over again. So let's look at the brain in action, right? The Postgres brain in action. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to execute the command explain and then a select statement. For those of you who are not familiar, the word explain before a command says don't run the command, just tell me what the plan is. Tell me what the optimizer has chosen to do, but don't do it. If you don't have to do it, just tell me, give me the show me the plan. Remember the plan? The plan is that part that goes into the execute. Okay. Any questions so far? It's the real plan. I'm sorry? It's the real plan because in Oracle there is a problem because uh, explain there is a different plan in. Uh, it's the same here, uh, yeah. Uh, versus the original uh, when we run the query. When we run the query in Oracle, we have uh, different uh, plan sometimes. Uh, why, why explain? Why would it do that? We don't know. Okay, no, we don't do that. Like, okay. explain it. Yeah, it's, it's going to be the same. Uh, so, so if we go and look at the most common value in the table, a P, it does an index scan, right? The index scan. Okay. Now, if we do a D, which is sort of middle of the pack, middle popular, it does an index scan. Okay. And if we do a K, which is the least common value, it does an index scan. And the first thing. First reaction I have to these three slides is I don't understand. This optimizer doesn't seem to be very smart because I've used three different values that have different popularity, and the optimizer is doing the same thing. Okay? And that's a bad thing. And the reason it's doing this is because we don't have to have any statistics on the system. Now, the way you can create statistics is with the analyze command. Okay? Or there is auto vacuum, which is part of Postgres, will automatically analyze your data as it changes. So 
So every time you add new, a significant amount of new data, you change a significant amount of data, auto vacuum will automatically update the statistics for you. Okay. In this case, I manually had to run it. Right? But normally, so when you have, if you ever look at this kind of case and the author is doing the same thing for the same value, probably it's something wrong. It shouldn't probably be wrong. So as soon as I give statistics on the table, I'm now getting what I think I should get as an answer. So here we have the most common value in Postgres, and we're getting in this in this sample table, and we're getting a P. Uh, we're getting a sequential scan, which is what I expect, because effectively, 78% of the rows are P's, right? So why would you use an index? There's no reason to use an index. Indexes are only good if they're very selective. If you're using an index, you typically have to be, you're looking at 2 or 3% of the rows. Anything more than that, typically you're going to do a sequential scan or maybe a bitmap scan. Okay. So, um, the most common value the optimizer chooses is sequential scan. And a sequential scan is exactly the way it sounds. Start at the beginning of the table, read every 8K block, okay, and execute the query. All right, and that's what we expect for a very common value in the table. You start to see, okay, now the optimizer seems a little smarter for me. Okay. What if I do a D? Now, the D. Uh, I think it was like 2% or 3 what was that? Let me take it. Where's the D? Right here. 1.6%. 1.6% of the rows is a D, and it does something called a bitmap index scan. A bitmap index scan effectively scans the index, creates a bitmap, and then looks up the rows based on the bitmap. All right? And it prevents you from using the index and revisiting a whole bunch of pages that all, you know, multiple times. So you get you make a bitmap through the you run through the index once, you make you get a bitmap of all the pages that potentially have rows, and then you look at each page and find them. Okay. So that's a bitmap. There's our optimizer realizing, hey, I should be using bitmap scan. This is a sort of middle popular value. Okay. And when I do a K, remember there's only one K in this table, um, it does exactly what we think, and that's an index scan. All right, so this is the first case where we've seen the optimizer actually doing some smarts. It's, I'm sending the same query. All I'm changing is the, is the constant, okay? And the point is the optimizer knows how popular that constant is because of the statistics that I generated with Analyze or the statistics that auto vacuum would normally generate for you. <coughs> Any questions? What's the output of, of the uh, analyzed sample? What, what does it know uh, from analyzing the sample? Table? So what does analyzed sample know? So analyzed sample um, will know the 100 most common values, and it will create a histogram of, of 100 buckets uh, of distribution of the whole you know, scan of, of value. So um, anytime you're asked Accessing one of the most 100 most common values, you're typically um, you're typically getting a pretty good estimate of how many values are in there. Yeah. Now you can change that. You can have more statistics or less statistics. So you can control the number of buckets, which defaults 100. Okay. And we're continuing to improve that. We have somebody. Um, we have a patch in Postgres 11 uh, feature, which is much smarter about choosing those 100 values. I don't, I don't want to get into the math of it, but much smarter about uh, figuring out how common values are. Uh, and then in Postgres 12, uh, well, actually in Postgres 10, we added multivariate statistics, so statistics on two column combinations. And I think in Postgres 12, we'll improve that even more. So. The point is that statistics <coughs> are always getting improved. Like, you know, it isn't like a static thing. Um, Postgres 10 had new improvements, Postgres 11 will have improvements, and Postgres 12 will have improvements. So those statistics are getting better and better. Um, and with, without statistics, the optimizer is pretty blind, as you saw from that example. But as soon as it gets statistics, wow, uh, it really 
uh, it's really hard to have it go wrong. Can I have another? Yeah, of course. Where are these stored? They're stored in a in a in a system table called PG statistic. It's very short. Great. Yes, sir. Question. The lab, uh, the levels on which you choose between the bitmap scan, for yeah. example, index scan, are somehow uh, configurable in Cortex that you can uh, manually change. Okay. Because you know that you want to use. Right. Index so, for, for so the actual breakpoints of where an index is chosen is not configurable, but you can configure aspects of the hardware. For example, random page cost is very um, significant in whether an index is used or not. So for example, if you're on an SSD, you should be lowering random page cost because index access and random access on an SSD is easier. So it defaults to four in, um, the random page cost defaults to four in Postgres, you probably want to set like 1.1 1 .1 on SSDs. Uh, if you have a mix of SSDs and magnetic disks, you can actually put the random page cost on the table spaces. So the table spaces that are SSDs would have a different random page cost than the ones that are on magnetic disk. And that's typically where you're going to be making those kind of tunings. Um, not so much the break even point, but actually the hardware behavior. Right. right. How do you know how to set random page now that's a great question. So if you look at the Postgres docs, there's like a two paragraph section that talks about how to set it. Um, I wrote a lot of it, um, or improved it actually in Postgres 9.6. Uh, random, well, random page cost assumes magnetic disk. It assumes that the hardware is, uh, I'm trying to remember the example. I think it assumes that random page cost is a hundred times slower than sequential, but it also assumes that the cache has 80% of the rows in it, uh, so we don't hit the index. So it ends up being, that's how we end up, we actually explain in the docs how we got the number four, <laughs> basically. Mm -hmm. um, and again, if you feel that number is not representative, you can change it in Postgres comp, you can change it in uh, per table space, perhaps, if you have a mix of different types of hardware. Is it possible to have a benchmark and when I get a new storage device and I run the benchmark and I say, oh, it's 2.6, or is it 1.1? 1 .1? The, yeah, uh, unfortunately, no. And the reason is that there is a lot of caching effect in that number. So if we were literally hitting the storage every time we did an index scan, then we could use that number. Okay, but typically what happens is that even though the random page cost might be much higher than four, certainly, but because so many things are cached, a lot of times index lookups are actually much cheaper. So it's not only the random cost, but it's the, effect, the cache size as well. It's affecting that number, and there's no real good way to. It, it, it's we're too far away from the actual storage to use a benchmark to get that number. If that makes any sense. Um, other questions? <clears throat> so, um, this is what an index scan looks like, very similar to tree, you know, your standard. standard. So let's, let's take this whole thing and pull it together. We haven't even talked about join methods yet, right? We're, not, we're, not, we're still talking about access. Um, uh, you know, uh, options, okay, uh, scan mode default, okay. So um, here's a query, and actually goes through for every letter, and it runs an explain on that. And if I kind of put it together in this kind of query, I get this. And I think this is a great slide, because what it's showing you is in red, the most common value of doing a sequential scan. As you move down, the less common, the middle common values are doing a bitmap scan. And then down here at the bottom, the most rare values are doing the index scan. This is exactly what you would expect the optimizer to do. Okay? So I love this slide because every time you're running explain, you're like, oh, he sees a bunch of words come out. Well, this is like a nice visual to show you the optimizer making these kind of decisions based on how common. 
questions? Good. So, um, let's let's just change it up a little bit. Uh, you can turn off some of the scan methods. So if I turn off sequential scan, I turn off bitmap scan, I run it again. What I get is a case where every value does an index scan. Okay, so by doing this, I force the system to use index scans. But what's really interesting is that the, the, the rare values were already doing index scans, so those costs are not changed. But take a look at how high this gets. This gets up to 39 for a cost. Okay? Whereas the normal sequential scan is a third of that, a 13. Okay? And if you want to try this yourself, you can actually take a query and turn off some of the scan methods and watch the time, watch the cost go up, and watch the execution time go up, right? So you're you're basically removing intelligence from the optimizer, all right? And when you do that, your queries will slow down and you will find the cost is high. Alright, so if you're curious and you want to play around and you think you know better than the optimizer, give it a crack, check it out. Any questions? Okay, so remember I told you that, so that's the first thing the optimizer has to decide, is scan that, right? How popular is the value? Do I want to do an index scan? Do I want to do a sequential scan or a bit scan? That's the decision. The second decision it has to make is how do I join these rows together? If I'm doing a join, now the first one we can do a join, but if I'm doing, if I'm joining things, how do you want to join it together? There's actually something called a nested loop. I'll show you what that looks like. There's actually two types of nested loops. Okay? There's a hash join, which I'll talk about. I'll show you an example of that. And then there's also a merge join. You may not have heard of merge join. You don't see it a whole lot except in databases, but it's actually very powerful. Okay? So let's take a look at the second decision the optimizer has to make. And to do that, we're actually going to create some more temporary tables. Um, we're going to use pgproc. We're going to grab some OIDs there. And we're going to create a table called sample1. And we're going to create a table called sample2. Okay? Uh, sample1 will pull rows from pgproc. Sample2 will pull rows from pgclass. Okay? Now, um, if I join sample one and sample two, and I use a where clause like this, the optimizer has decided that it wishes to do a nested loop. Okay, nested loop is probably the simplest kind of join you can do with pretty much any kid, if you any child. You ask them, well, how do I bring it? Well, I'll take this one. I'll pick it up. So this is a this is a nested loop with a sequential scan. It takes every row from this side compares to every row on the other side. Okay? Not very really smart. Not very really smart. But it's very fast. <laughs> so if you have two little tables, just do it, just do a nested loop. There's like five rows in each table, 25. What's the big deal? Right? You see it used a lot for small things. So set up Required, no hashing, no sorting, no indexing, access, just compare. Right? That's a two function for the optimizer when it has a ve two very small tables in mind. Okay? Any questions? And it looks like this, this is what the, the pseudo proof is. So um, let's try two tables, but instead of saying equals 33. We're going to say greater than 33. Remember the other one was equal? Equal 33, it's pretty small, right? Like there's not that, there's only one row on the one side of 33. But if I say greater than 33, the system's like, oh, okay, now we're not, okay, now we got some action going. Now we now we have a bigger job. inside of um, its hash bucket, and then for each row on the outer side, I hash the value, 
and I look in the bucket to see if I have any matches. All right? This is the most popular and common joint method in all relational databases. I know Postgres favors it. I've been told other databases favor it as well. Okay? Um, it's just a really good solution. Again, it's too complex for small tables. If you've got two medium-sized tables, uh, assuming this hash will fit memory, okay, is actually really, really useful and really fast. So again, this is another decision the optimizer is making to try and figure out, hey, how big is one side? How big is the other side? Do I want to do a nested loop? Do I want to do a hash join? Right? And it knows kind of how many rows. It uses statistics to figure out how selective these things are. And it makes estimates. And it basically makes the decision. And this is what it kind of looks like. Keep in mind, you have to hash the stuff first. So you have this setup. This setup part of it. OK. Um, third one, here we just join the two tables, and we have no restriction at all. There's no restrictions. There's not greater than or equal to 33. There's not equal to 33. Just take this big table and join to this other big table. And you can see the system has chosen something called a merge joint. You don't hear about it too much. Merge joints are very popular in relational databases because you can't, yes, the loop is too slow for big tables. Hash join, you can't get the whole table in memory sometimes. So you end up doing a merge join. A merge join is a case where you sort one side, you sort the other side, and then you walk step by step through the two tables, joining them as they go. Here's what it looks like. First this side is sorted, then this side. And we first take the first row of the first one side and we compare it to the first row of the other side. Okay? If they match, that's a join. And we do this here. That's not a match. So then we go back here. Now, instead of having to start back at the beginning, because this is sorted, we can continue where we stopped. That's the whole beauty of a merge joint. We're not having to go backward. Now I can compare this match, this match doesn't match. Now when I go back here, again, don't have to go back up here. I don't have to go back up here. I know that if there is an ACC, it's going to be here. Right? Or later. Could be later. Then. Okay. But it's never going to be before that. And you basically are going. So you're kind of going lockstep through scans. It's kind of like you're scanning two sides simultaneously and you're kind of joining them as you're going, but you never have to go backwards. Right? And again, anytime you're joining large data, it's actually really important. Also, if you have an index, we can sometimes use the index instead of having to sort. Too. Yeah. Uh, sorting large tables uh, requires a lot of memory, I suppose. So sorting large tables will actually cause us to spill the disk. So we'll spill, we'll actually have a tape sort. So if we're trying to sort something that's too big, we'll, we'll sort in batches and then we'll merge them together and then we'll walk through the tapes of both sides to join it together. So you can do you can do merge joints far exceeding your physical memory. Yeah. Which you cannot do with uh, hash joining because you because when the hash spills over it doesn't really behave very well. And you, and that's the loop would be there forever. I mean, if you had a million if you had a million row table on one side and a million row table on the other, that's a trillion comparisons, right? That's not probably gonna end very soon. Um, and that's why you end up that's why you end up seeing the merge joints happen for large data sets. <laughs> How does the Postgres know if Postgres will fit into memory? I mean, when when Postgres decides whether to do hash join or merge join. Right. So um, we have a, a setting in Postgres called WorkMem, and it, it limits how much local memory a, a session can allocate. So typically, if you are uh, doing a hash join, your hash join has to fit in that work memory allocation size. And if it doesn't, we'll have a tendency to favor something that isn't constrained like a merge joint. 
Okay, so it's work underscore mem is what controls how much memory we, we we're going to allow a single session to allocate for something like a sort or a hash. Um, for hashing, it's kind of weird because the hash all has to be in memory. For a sort, you can do it in batches, but you can't hash in batches because then the then the buckets end up spilling the disk and the, the whole thing falls apart. So um, that's kind of how it works. When it decides to, to do a hash, will it fall back to the uh, because the false result is not know the, the exact the, the size of the paper. Yeah. That's, that's so in the middle of the query. Oh, right. In the middle of the query, it'll, it'll, um, that's a great question. So if in the middle of the query it exceeds it, I think it'll, um, will it go beyond the workmen? I'm yes. trying to remember what it'll do. It'll go beyond the workmen. Okay. So it'll, I guess it'll use the workmen as an estimate, but if it goes over, it's like, okay, you know. I don't think it'll go over too much, but <laughs> hopefully, yeah. But thanks. Other questions? Yeah. I don't know what's going on on ice for this time, where it was, is, is those statistics are calculated automatically? Now, that's a good point, that's a good point because. Ah, that was one. Right, so, um, uh, last thing before we get to that, what I want to show you is even if I switch the table around and the query doesn't Postgres is a, is a, is a, a cost-based optimizer, not a rule-based optimizer. A rule-based optimizer would join things in the order you express them. Postgres doesn't. Yeah, we didn't have this because this this join had no where clause. This was a merge join, but now that we have statistics and we know our statistics roughly accurate, we have now chosen to do a hash join. Okay, so just again, just like with scan types, the existence of X actually changed the way Postgres behaved. I think that's I think that's kind of cool. Um, Here's another one. Uh, if you do, you can actually do a right arrow join, and it'll use a hash, which is kind of tricky. Some system. Uh, it will, it, when you're doing a link, you kind of have to put this side because of the way does. Okay, this has to be on the other side. So that's how we, that's how we end up hashing this side and we <coughs> join the other. Okay. Uh, if you do a cross join, I'm not sure if you've seen a cross join. But the SQL standard specifies something called cross join. Cross join says join every row to every row. Surprise! It because it's like asking, you're basically telling it to do an estimate because you've asked for a cross join. So this case, <clears throat> okay, right at first I do statistics, then I add statistics. Now I'm going to put indexes on the two tables I'm joining. Okay, you're going to see some changes. Here's the first one. Remember, this one originally was a nested loop. Remember, it was a nested loop. Okay. However, instead of being a nested loop with two sequential scans, now it's a nested loop with two index scans. Right? Because it can. Because it's got an index there. It's like, well, do I want to do a sequential scan to find my 33? Or do I want to use the index that's sitting right there? Well, let's use the index, right? Um, same thing. When I'm on the inner side, I'm trying to find all the 33s. Why am I doing a sequential scan on the inner side? There's no reason. So effectively, what happens is your outer side can use an index to look up the matches on the inner side without having to do a sequential scan on the inner side. Right? Kind of cool. Very convenient, right? You can see See how the existence of an index all of a sudden makes the loop not so terrible, right? And that kind of makes sense. And that's what it looks like here. So here's another one. Um, I'm going to do. Uh, I'm going to do it with uh, letters um, instead of numbers. I'm going to use numbers up to this point. So I'm going to use A. Does anybody remember what letter I used for junk before? Way back in the query. 
let's check it out. X. Okay. So I used X. So now I'm going to ask for I'm going to ask for A. So give me and the system is like you know I look at my statistics and I can swear there's not a single A in that table, right? But I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt and I'm going to assume there's one row that's an A and one row on the other side is an A. And I'm going to do a nested loop because I swear we're not going to get any rows, but I'm going to do it anyway. Because again, the statistics are not always 100% accurate, so they can be off by maybe 10%. So it's like, okay, we'll, we'll humor you, we'll We'll run this quickly, but again, we're making the assumption that there's very few rows. If there was a lot of rows, you would have seen a hash join here, or you would have seen a merge join here. All right? Because if I run the same query and I change my the X, it becomes a hash join. Because again, the system knows there's really no A's there, but I'm going to assume there's one. But as soon as you do X's, I know everyone's, I know every row is an X, and I know every one of these. It is, because I don't do that. So again, using a rare value, you get an absolute, as soon as it's small, doing a common value, boom, get a hash Um. Just to wrap, just to sort of head toward the end, we're going to take some more questions. Um, the other thing, the limit, you wouldn't think that the limit command would affect the optimizer, but in fact it does. Um, limit command, I read was equal years, years ago, um, and Postgres adopted it. Uh, the cool thing about the limit command is it actually optimizes your job. I'll show you why. So to a join from this table to this table, nowhere close at all, it does a hash join. Okay? But you and the limit bumps to a next table. Well, you have an order by, which means it wants the lowest value in sample one joined to the lowest value in sample two, the lowest join possibility, right? Because I'm, I'm ordering by by this field right here. So actually, I want the lowest join for this field. All right. So, so the stupid way to do this would be to run the entire query and do a hash join like, like I had here. OK? And then say, oh, there's one. Just give me. Now that I've done all this work, give me the first row. Right? That's probably not the way you want to do it. So what it does is it pulls the lowest row from the index. And it tries to join that to the lowest row in the other index. And it gets one row, gives you the row that stops. I mean, that's really cool, right? Because we know we don't want more than one row. So why would we spend all the time hashing all the rows and joining them? We know we don't need to pull stuff off. This is a great example where indexes are actually helping the optimizer to do a faster job in the type of plan that gets generated because we, it allows us to short circuit a lot of work that we don't need to do. Particularly, it's the link between the idea of having an order by and the index and the limit. So having those three together, an order by with a limit and then an index somewhere allows us to be much faster. And in fact, if we then ask for 10 rows, it's still, it's, adult, I know you want 10 of them, but it's still got to be faster to get 10 rows joined. It is to do this to all of them, okay? And when you get to 100, when you get to 100, it's like, okay, I, I, I don't think this is going to win. Try to do this index by index lookup. We're going to do the full hash join, and then we're going to sort the result, and then. So that that's the last slide. Pictures this. Page.
paint the picture is kind of cool because this is kind of the way the optimizer works. It's, it's, it's seeing little rocks. It's going one way or another based on statistics, based on the indexes that are there, based on um, the, the type of values you're supplying, how pop, how common they are or not common, the size of the tables. All these things sort of affect that 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 smarts that the optimizer is using. And you hope at the end that you end up getting, I mean, when you think of the way the water flows, it flows the easiest way possible. And, and, and in the perfect optimizer, that is exactly the way it would work. It would flow to the easiest possible solution. And you can okay. So um, this is the last slide. Let's take some questions and see what people have maybe that they have not yet. Yes, sir. Uh, how does optimizer know which index to choose? Assuming there are some more to choose. Right. So how does the optimizer know which index to choose? Effectively, the optimizer knows the statistics of the columns that make up the index. So if it has several indexes to choose from, it will look at the selectivity of the constants supplied to the query and which indexes match up with those constants. Okay. Um, so, for example, if you said, this, uh, this is a, a typical example, you have an index, you have a, a customer table, and you have an index on city, and you have an index on state. So this is a pencil. This is a U.S. example, but let's assume like province and country, right? What? It's going to choose the province index. If you, if you do a query and you give it both province and country, it's going to choose province because province is more, is more specific. It's, it's more unique, and I'm more likely to get fewer hits if I look up that one. If I do country, I'm likely to hit a lot more, right? So the, the optimizer automatically figures out which one it wants to go to based on that type of logic. Other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, is it possible for the optimizer to estimate time required to run the query? Is it possible to estimate the time? So, um, what actually um, you see here, I didn't go into it, but there is, uh, I, um, it's a whole complex part. But effectively, the way the optimizer works is it costs everything, it has a cost. And when it picks a plan, it always picks a plan with the cheapest cost. So, there is a correlation between the cost number and how long it will take. But every piece of hardware is different. You might have a low cost number on some really fast hardware, and you may have a low cost number on some really slow hardware. And again, one might be 100 times that cost, and one might be 10 times that cost. Um, there really isn't a way to do it unless you do explain, analyze, and it will actually generate the cost for you. It'll show you how long each of these stages took of time and to run the query as well. And then you can get a total cost, total time as well. Okay, so uh, let's take a step back. Is it possible for the optimizer to estimate number of uh, uh, I operations? Yes, yes. So um, the, the cost number is a combination of CPU cost, memory cost, and I O. Um, so it's kind of a, it's kind of slushed into one number. Uh, I don't think there's a way to break it out so much, but you can increase or decrease the I.O. costs of your specific system, and therefore the system will be more favorable to getting better plans. Um, the bottom line, though, is that these are all just estimates, so they're never going to be exactly right, and frankly, they never need to be exactly right, because all when you're choosing between a hash join and a merge join, you just need the hash join to be cheaper. You don't care if it's cheaper by 100 points or one point, right? There are some queries that are like so close to the edge that like a little thing will make it go, and people are, that's annoying. That's annoying. Usually, it doesn't matter. Like the most of them are pretty much the same amount of time. But sometimes, you'll have really close costs, and there might be a significant difference in execution time. Um, in those cases, you should probably start looking at some of the, uh, the costs that are in Postgres comp to kind of see maybe these numbers are a little too high for my system, like random page cost or, or I O or sequential scan cost or uh, um, CPU cost for operations, uh, function call cost. You can 
can control a lot of these um, to kind of fine tune it closer to your system. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, I was running the queries uh, as you were presenting yeah. them. Yeah. And I've got strange costs like about 20 trillion. 20 trillion costs. Uh, yeah, that's so. So the cost numbers can be huge. Yeah, um, it depends. These are these are numbers from uh, maybe an older version of Postgres. Maybe some of the numbers are higher. Uh, is that with my data or some other data? Is this my data? Yeah, your data. My SQL file is yeah. giving you those numbers. Yeah. So we might have changed it to be a bigger number, but it's kind of the same. The numbers are really only made. The number doesn't mean anything. The number only means something in comparison to a different number. So that's how we're doing. Oh, okay. Sure. Sure. Other questions? Yes. Is there a possibility to put things in the query? So, for example, from the job between sample one, sample two, yeah. yeah. you have use as a table, and uh, you have another table, and for this another table, you use dash job. Yeah, you can turn off. Um, where did I do it? You can turn off. Uh, some of the settings, where is that? Right here. So you can turn off, if you turn off all everything but hash join, everything will be hash join. So you turn off everything else and whatever's left, that's what optimizer is going to do. Yeah. But it's not pretending, it's just for the whole query. Yeah. No, very much. I, I, don't, I don't recommend you do it like in production, but if you want to play with it, it's like, this is the way to play with it. Yeah. But okay, so if that is you can call a single. But Single, yeah. This is just for this session. It doesn't right, affect right. other people. But you probably, you probably don't want to change it in Postgres comp, or like the optimizer is going to be bad, like it's going to be stupid, and then it's going to be. Right? I, I know that I should use as a proxy for calling the query. Yeah, you just do it right here. This doesn't change any session, but it, it, this will stay true until you reset them. So from here all the way, as many queries as you can, stay the same. And then when you're done, you reset them back to the original values. Okay. Yes, sir. About histogram. Histogram. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, there's only one, but as I said before, in Postgres 11, we've improved the histogram and the statistics scattering. So we have a statistician who worked who work on Postgres 11, and the use of the, the way that we choose the histograms is better in 11 than it was in earlier releases. But you can't, and, and, and you probably understand it better than I do, but there's some, distrib, no, there's some number distributions that our old histogram and statistics did not work well for up till 11. Um, yeah, I don't remember the names of the distributions, but he said, here's a distribution, and our thing doesn't do well with it. So he improved it for 11. Yeah. And that'll be out in September. The second question. Yeah. If you're from the class, for example, can we assign a specific plan to a specific query? So plan stability, we, talk, we talked about that. Uh, right now, we don't offer it, but, but we're we we seem to talk about it. I don't I don't know but we talk we definitely talked about it. Um, yeah, we talked about it. But I don't I don't know a whole lot about it yet. I will say that people normally ask for plan stability when they're coming from another database, and nobody who uses Postgres asks. I've never heard of a person who uses Postgres regularly who asks for plan stability. That doesn't mean it doesn't exist. But everyone, every time I hear plan stability, it's from somebody coming from another database who feels they need it in Postgres. And my answer has always been, try Postgres first and figure out what you need it, then we'll figure it out. Because you may, there's a lot of things that you need to do in other databases that you don't need to do in Postgres, and plan stability may be one of them. That's, that's my, that's, that's what I, that's what I, in my years of speaking, that's roughly what I've determined is the case. Thanks a lot. Great, of course. Mm -hmm. I'm taking a few steps yeah. back. Um, the does auto vacuum somehow uh, gather statistics? Did I get it right? Or yes, auto vacuum will gather statistics every time the table changes by, I think, 20% or 10%. You can set the, the threshold. 
But every time the table changes by that amount, it'll automatically update statistics for you. So your system always pretty much is up to date. Yeah. So I think it's I think it's a great. That's yeah. That's why normally you never run analyze. It's, it's always you know you load a table and within a minute it has statistics. But if you if you load a table and you want to run queries within the first minute, maybe you want to run analyze. So you, you don't want to wait for a vacuum to wake up. And do it. So okay. I've seen that cases also, um, and I should mention this. Um, uh, oops, sorry. Temporary tables. Temporary tables. Temporary tables. You have to, and that's kind of a, a gotcha. Mm -hmm. I, I complained about it. Everyone's like, "Well, it's a temporary table. It's not really global. So how is this other process going to see it?" I'm like, "Yeah, I know." So anyway, at least you now know. Uh, <laughs> you, you have to. Run uh, yeah, I'm, I am. I, I'm going to take these last two. I, I am running out of time, so I do appreciate that. Yes, sir. I have a question about the uh, uh, default target statistic. Yeah. So is it more to set the maximum value than is than thousand? Set it to a thousand. Even number of statistic buckets. Yeah, you can yeah, increase exactly. to a thousand. Yeah. What do you think about the performance? Of course, if you set the maximum value, that means. Uh, Are you going to do it for every table or just one table? That's true. That's the question. Uh, you can choose the table in general. Yeah, uh, I mean. And I'm yeah, more to set the maximum value than the. Uh, if you set to like, if you set to like ten thousand, you're probably not gonna do well. It's gonna be over there. But a thousand five hundred, it's probably okay. I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it blindly because in most cases your statistics are fine. Like, I, I would wait for a table that needs it and then I'd add, I'd increase it. But normally I don't tell people just that. Um, but again, yeah, you could probably take it up quite a bit, two to three hundred, no problem. Yeah. Okay, but how much? Is this? And not 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 a whole lot unless you're doing a lot of data warehouse and you have queries that have more than more than a hundred common values, but like less than five hundred common values. That's the case where you kind of get caught there. Yeah, but again, Postgres eleven is better at this, and you may find that you don't need it anymore in eleven. So I'm not. We're still we're still making it better. Yeah. Your last yeah. question. Yeah. Are required to no, you don't need to run analyze after uh, index at all. The statistics are on the columns, they're not on the indexes. But the only case that does have statistics in the index is expression indexes. If you do an expression index, there actually is um, there actually is uh, statistics on the index itself because the expression is not technically a column. Right, and in fact, um, I have a blog. I have a blog on my website. It's like 450 items, all categorized, and I do have an item that talks about the ability to create statistics on expression indexes and how good I put that is. And that is kind of unfortunately my last question. I would love to stay for another hour, uh, but hmm. it's uh, maybe next month. I'm sorry. Maybe next month. Next month. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Thanks very much and have a great day.